Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the what was it, April 8, 2024 workshop for the Green City Council. I'm Mayor PJ Colley. I'll be presiding over today's workshop. First, I'd like to call on our city clerk for the roll call. Yes, sir. Mayor Connolly. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Daniels. Present. Council Member Foreman. Council Member Blackburn. Present. Council Member Scully. Here. Council Member Robinson. Here. Council Member Willis. Here. All right, Mayor Conley, you have a form. Thank you very much. Well, now move on to the approval of the agenda. Mayor Manager, no further changes. changes. So, motion to approve. Second. Second. All right, motion has been made by Council Member Blackburn, second by Mayor Pro Tem Daniels. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion passes 5 0. All right. Move right on to new business. Thank, thank you, Mayor. The first item tonight is presentation on sports complex feasibility study. This will be uh, picking up based off of the, uh, the information that Council wanted us to bring back per the, uh, the planning session at the end of January. I'll now call forward our Executive Director of Recreation and Parks and Capital and Facility Planning, Don Optigan, to start our presentation. All right, good afternoon, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Pro today as a member of Council. Uh, today we are uh, here to give another presentation on the Greenville Sports Complex Feasibility Study. Uh, if you recall, back in January at the City Planning Council session, we provided an update on the baseball softball complex, what it would, what the operating costs would be, the capital costs, uh, and also um, how a 12-field baseball softball complex would look uh, if we brought one to Greenville. Uh, today, from that, Council Director City staff uh, to work with Victus Advisors to come back with the following information, uh, the impact of adding a soccer field or cross field component. I'll tell you here about uh, adding four fields to this, the operating margin, uh, margin impact, economic fiscal impact, and also the cost of capital. Also, uh, we also reviewed with uh, Mr. Connolly, who's here today, uh, the operating pro forma uh, that he had for baseball softball complex and took a closer look at the expenses if the city of Greenville would run that complex based on a staffing plan and uh, the organizational chart for that complex. Also looked at other revenue opportunities that would exist uh, for a, a so-called uh, sports complex. Also today we'll be uh, giving an update uh, by the direct, uh, Director of Financial Services, Jacob Rejoiner, what, would, what the uh, fiscal impact to the city budget would be to finance a sports complex project. So we'll kick it off uh, with Mr. Brian Connolly of Victus Advisors uh, to run through the baseball softball complex. Thanks, Ron. Good afternoon. It's good to see you all again. Uh, my name is Brian Connolly from Victus Advisors. Um, so the first thing that, that we did um, after the presentation I made, I guess it was probably about six weeks ago, um, sat down with, with Don and his team and, and walked through on the expense side what um, this baseball softball tournament complex could look like if it was specifically operated by um, the Parks and Recreation Department. So the ex expenses that we put together um, for our feasibility study were based upon um, looking at benchmark regional facilities in a, in a multi-state region. And the one um, item that, that was flagged there on the expense side is the salaries, wages, and benefits. So we made an update to that line. Basically, the, the regional benchmark um, salaries and wages were, were somewhat higher than um, the uh, salary and, and wage um, specifications for your Parks and Recreation Department. So we made adjustments to that to lower the salaries and wages a little bit. And then we also removed, uh, we had in our operating expenses, we had a dedicated uh, marketing staff member as, as part of the, the facility operating team. And in talking to, to um, Andrew, um, he said we could take that out because they would take on the responsibility for, for marketing the facility. So um, the two key improvement uh, changes to the, to the performa, the salaries, wages, and benefits were, were lower right here, so that's highlighted. Um, and then the second thing that um, we talked about with, with Don and his team is what are some other revenue opportunities that could potentially get the facility from operating at a loss to at least break even? So when we put together our base models and we don't have a site identified yet, um, there's kind of two things we don't typically include in that base model. One of them is a, uh, a naming rights partner for the facility, and I think I talked a little bit about that last time. That's an opportunity that can be worth, um, you know, $100,000, $150,000, a year potentially based upon comparable uh, corporate naming rights deals. Not all the communities we work with decide to sell a, to, to sell a naming rights uh, deal, um, or they try to sell it and they can't find a, a local partner that has the capacity that makes sense. So we did not include that, and we're still not including that. We're just showing basic advertising on this line. Um, the second opportunity for 
um, for, for potentially reducing any operating losses, potentially getting to break even, um, is something we're working with a couple of communities on right now that are doing operational improvement plans. And that is the ability for the facility itself to charge for parking um, or um, to be able to charge some sort of ticket fee. So what we've shown in here now is a parking fee um, during weekend tournament events. So when we don't have a site yet, we don't know, you know, is the site big enough that it can accommodate uh, the parking on site that the, the operating staff could also control. So this comes with the caveat that you know, when, when you get to, if you get to the point where you're actually looking at specific sites, that you make sure the site is large enough to not only accommodate the fields, but also be able to accommodate all of the parking demand and to control that parking um, and charge a, a, a parking fee for, for, for a weekend events. So during the week, local use practices, you wouldn't charge for parking. But when you're doing a tournament, um, being able to charge the, the visitors um, a parking fee uh, is something that could really help in terms of uh, potentially eliminating that operating deficit. As a reminder, this is the economic impact model that we put together um, for the baseball softball complex. I'm showing this now because we're going to then walk through what the impacts could be of adding um, four rectangular fields potentially to the to the mix. So, as a reminder, we we estimated. Um, about $44 million in total economic output that's based upon direct spending for travelers coming uh, from outside of, of the Greenville market uh, to come for multi-day baseball, softball tournaments, staying overnight, spending money in the community. Um, with the, the high, high level of baseball, softball event activity, we, we estimated potential for over 70,000 room nights and then county sales and hotel taxes that go along with, with those totaling more than $1.2 million a year. So then we were asked by, um, by this group to do an analysis of potentially adding four rectangular fields to the baseball softball complex to see what types of impacts that would have to the facility. So we talked with some local um, lacrosse and soccer groups about the potential for adding these fields. So the top line here is local usage, and then down here, the, the bottom half is, is really focused on tournament impact. So from a local usage standpoint, Pitt County Youth Lacrosse said that they would love to have access to four fields um, for additional practice time, um, and the Soccer Association said that they could use up to eight additional fields for um, practices and games primarily during the week. So from a local use standpoint, there was definitely demand to be able to get on these fields. Uh, primarily in the spring and fall were the, the biggest demand times for that. However, on the tournament side of things, it was a different story. Both groups said the only way for, um, for them to be able to use a new facility for tournaments was if there were at least eight rectangular fields um, on the site. So they said with only four rectangular fields, it would primarily be um, a local use amenity for additional practice and game time. Um, they said there was a small possibility that maybe one of their existing tournaments um, could potentially use their, their home fields and um, bring a couple more teams and, and, and expand that tournament a little bit, but it was really just kind of one opportunity that one of them spoke about. So what that means in, in terms of usage, um, as you can see, um, mostly weekday in-county usage so um, it would be an additional local use amenity, um, very little outside um, out of county visitation associated with just adding four additional fields, uh, four additional rectangular fields. Um, what that does to the, the operating model, you can see um, it's not really increasing the profitability very much. It's essentially um, a break even based upon primarily just additional rental income that would be charged to, to those teams that would be using it. In terms of economic impact, this box right here, this shows the baseball softball economic impacts um, for the tournament baseball softball complex. So comparatively, you can see the, uh, the economic impact from adding four local use fields is, is um, pretty minimal. Um, you know, a small fraction of what the tournament focused 12 field baseball softball complex would do from an economic impact standpoint. So the key takeaway here is you could add the four fields 
But if you're only doing four fields in one place, um, you're not going to generate economic impact, but it would be, um, you know, obviously additional benefit to, to local lacrosse and, and soccer programs that could rent, rent some time on additional field space. In terms of additional costs, so um, if you remember, we estimated um, the 12 field baseball softball facility at about $30 million. Um, adding four fields with lights, um, potentially needing some, some additional amenities to service those fields. We're looking at about 40, 41 million. Um, this is um, not 71, but adding about 10 million to get to, to 40 million. Um, so the cost jumps up from about 30 million to 40 million. All right, so next, uh, Jacob will get, uh, Mr. Jordan will get up here and talk about this. Yes, ma'am. Can I ask a question? Sure. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, thank you for your presentation. Yep. That was really good. Um, when you said that you were decreasing the wages, do you know right offhand what that would look like? Uh, yeah, we have that. Sure. Yeah, so based on our current uh, city pay plan and also the, the uh, organization chart we use for uh, ma maintaining that complex, It'll be about two hundred twelve thousand dollars decrease from Victus operate model. Uh, that is one position less uh, than what they had proposed. Okay. Taking out the marketing position that the the visitors bear. Yeah, and that's similar to our operations currently with recreation park. So okay. the marketing position be paid two hundred thousand dollars a year. Is that what you're saying? No, so um, the, the, the salary ranges that, the salary ranges that we use when we put together our staffing plan um, were based on multi-state regional benchmark amounts, and the um, salary ranges for the Parks and Rec Department, your Parks and Rec Department are actually lower than the regional benchmark. So we're basically saying we're going to pay people less money to work there than we originally mm -hmm. planned. For. As compared to the average uh, Correct. around the, the southeast region. Mm -hmm. Correct, yes. Okay. So the salaries and wages we had in there were based upon looking at facilities within a five to six hour drive time range um, and roughly the average is in terms of salaries, wages, and benefits, but your Parks and Recreation Department's salary bands are lower than the, the regional average. So that that was about probably 100, 140, 150,000 difference and then there was I think about a 60,000 plus wages position we had in there for a marketing manager that gotcha. the um, Visitors Bureau said you can take out because we'll handle the... Do you have more questions? No, I don't. Thank you. And thank you for asking that question because that was number one on my list. Um, so what's the number of people, I know you probably mentioned this before, but what's the number of people that could potentially be employed full-time jobs? Uh, we are now at, I think we had nine before and we're correct, at, and so now we're up to eight. So that's so eight, eight full-time full -time employees for the facility. Eight full-time employees, and Correct. everything else goes back to our recreation and park staff. <laughs> Correct, yeah. <laughs> God bless them. Um, <laughs> so this may fall more into comments, and if so, I can hold um, hold my remarks. But what, what what's parking going to look like? Is it going to be $5 every time you go over there, or just $5 for tournaments? $5 during tournaments, yes. And then um, when we talk about... You mentioned naming rights, but that's not been factored in. It has not, no. Because at that point, it would be the, I don't know, the Emmanuel, no, the Michael Cowan. <laughs> if, you, if, you have, if you have parking lots on site that are within a controlled perimeter that you can staff and um, charge for parking during tournaments, that's something that you can absolutely control. Um, assuming, again, this all is assuming that a site is selected that enables you to do that in terms of the size of the, size of the site. Whereas when it comes to, to naming rights, having a single corporate naming rights partner that's you know, your biggest partner, you can go out and try to sell it, but it's not something you fully control. So we, we didn't include that still because it's not something that you could just say, yes, we want to do it, and it's guaranteed. Okay. You still have to go out and sell it and find a partner that wants to do it. And, and, well, and, and, and by way of comment, sorry, hang on, Michael. By way of comment, we have enough things named after people. If we had something that belonged to the people of Greenville, it should just it should not just be a sports complex. But anyway, that's my comment. Go ahead, uh, And I, I was going to say, they'll talk, probably talk about this as we get further into the, the conversation. And this is The reason we did not put that in there originally and asked them not to put that in there is because this is a long this is a long process mm -hmm. of vetting the, the community and getting interest in the community and those are the kind of things if you're looking at partners who want to invest say some you did have a partner who wanted to invest a significant amount of money mm -hmm. 
just like at ECU with naming rights to, you know, Clark Clear Stadium, someone wanted to provide significant uh, naming rights with a, a major capital investment, that might be something that, uh, that we would want to entertain. Okay. And that, that tends to be a, this level of, of sort of city or county decision overall. Do, do we, are, are we a community that wants to do corporate naming rights to, to all our assets? So we work with communities where they just, they don't, they don't do corporate naming rights. If a donor wants to, to help out, they'll, they'll, they'll do, do a donor name. Um, then we work with other communities where every single building they build, every single amenity, it's, it's for sale. Yeah, got <laughs> so, it. Okay, thank yeah. you. You've answered my question. Okay. If I understand, it looks like the money that we are talking about, you said was going to be generated, that's really from the traveling industry. Correct. So if we're going to build a sports complex or add these rectangular fields, we need to step up to go after that market instead of being at four, we need to be at eight or ten, really. That would be my recommendation is that if you're if you're going to add the rectangular fields, if you go back to our very first study, um, we recommended at least eight to twelve rectangular fields. Five. If you want to tap into the the economic impact side of it, which will drive more tax dollars and, and you know well, or also another way of saying it, you know, Councilman Robinson, if this is the direction we want to go, then maybe we, we look at partnerships with current local organizations that might have capacity, right. already have the rectangular fields, and our ability to partner with them to add on additional to that for them. The, the key is they're located together um, in a place where you can park and access. So if you already have seven or eight in one location and you add four there, so it's all on one site, that's going to accomplish that same goal. I, I, I think when you gave your presentation earlier this year, I think some of the soccer folks came out and said, the, I think it's called the Beast of the East or the Soccer Tournament, that they could grow it a lot bigger if they had more fields, but they were limited by our fields in multiple places. But right. I guess... So we did actually include adding 10 teams to that, which is right. what they said they could do if they had four more fields that weren't co-located with their existing facilities. So the economic impact you did see was basically taking... Uh, I think a 90 team tournament turning into a 100 team, team tournament, but that's just one weekend. So hypothetically, the best place wherever we put this is to put it in one location, but you can have all of these style fields all in one location. So your parking services, all the athletic endeavors. Absolutely, yeah. And did you consider, or would it be a wise thing to consider, perhaps, like if they had a, an area that we do this in one location, and we've got common parking, that we have a pavilion where we can charge vendors to come in and pay a fee to locate yep. there for that weekend, sure. like yeah. a food truck or, or the sports wear or whatever. Sports and I think from are. an economic development standpoint, having it consolidated is going to help, too, with potentially driving a need for a hotel, um, having opportunities for other businesses to come up around it that, that are catering to visitors. And you start to create this sports stores and destination rather than if you spread it out, then, you know, you, you don't get that economic impact that, that you, or economic development opportunity you could if you consolidate it so that there's always people there, there's always visitors every weekend. In your experience, have you found that cities and counties partner together to share the cost because they all benefit from it? Ideally, yes. <laughs> um, but there's plenty of places where we, we work where the city and the county don't always get along. Um, I know that shocks you. But, that shocks <laughs> me. Um, ideally, absolutely. Because as you see when we do the economic impact numbers and the, and the economic fiscal impact numbers, you know, it, the, these opportunities benefit the city and the county. So if, if you have the ability to work together with the, the county as a strong partner um, to help, you know, pay for and sustain the facility, we, we absolutely recommend that if it is politically feasible. And actually, later on in the presentation, after uh, Mr. Joyner comes up, we'll talk more about the next steps and, and kind of how we kind of formulate those, those partnerships throughout the, the, our county and community. Thank you for answering my question. Sure. Cool. All right, so we'll call it Mr. Joyner now. And then after uh, Mr. Joyner finishes, uh, Mr. Kyle will come back up one more time. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the funding portion uh, for the sports complex that we're looking at. And we really break that into three separate parts, one of which is the operational funding that uh, Brian talked about just before. We also look at the fiscal impact of funding, those indirect revenues that we may experience with the city. And most importantly, we're looking at the capital construction uh, for the funding and how we're going to finance uh, building the facility. Um, so talk about operating at first real quick. And 
essentially what we're looking at is a break even. Um, right now, we're projecting a $160,000 uh, revenue side, which for city purposes is well within break even territory. Um, so the in annual impact will be minimal from a cost perspective um, to our total bottom line. Um, and fiscal impact are those indirect revenues we might experience. One of which is sales tax. Uh, we're projecting with all the fields eight hundred and thousand dollars worth of sales tax coming into the city, of which uh, into the county, and the city receives about thirty five percent of those sales taxes, which would be about two hundred and eighty six thousand dollars per year in additional sales tax revenue. And we also receive occupancy tax. Uh, we're look, projecting a little over four hundred thousand dollars there, and we split that evenly with the convention and visitor borough. So the city would see about two hundred twenty thousand dollars additional oxy tax from operating the fields. Um, then we'll move on to capital construction, and I think uh, what Brian shared the ranges for operating the twelve baseball fields and the four rectangular fields. We look at a meet low end of twenty eight point five million dollars for construction to a high end of forty one million dollars for construction. Uh, those projections do not include the cost of land, but do include design and construction of the facility. Uh, and given the magnitude of the project, uh, the city will be required to finance the construction through a debt issuance. Um, so the next thing we really look at is how much annually will the debt cost us as a city once we issue it. And that would be between 2.8 and 4.1 million dollars on an annual basis. Uh, once we construct the facility. Um, and that those estimates are based on 5% interest rates and a 20-year uh, debt service repayment. And the amounts would be heavily varied depending on how much the construction value and the estimates come in uh, once we would move closer to construction. Um, and then we'd ask ourselves, what sources of city revenue can we use to fund the debt? And for that, we're primarily looking at two different types of revenue, which would be our primary, uh, primarily be property taxes um, from our general fund revenues, as well as being able to use occupancy tax revenue to fund the construction. Um, and for that, we're looking at $1.5 million from the occupancy taxes on an annual basis to fund it at all different levels. That's about the max that we can sustain from our uh, hotel taxes. Uh, to offset the cost, and then we would be required to make up the difference with city uh, general revenues or property taxes, and that would range from 1.3 million to 2.6 million, depending on the cost of the facility. So, just kind of summarize uh, what we just went over is we pretty much break even operating the facility, uh, maybe have a slight uh, operating profit. Uh, we look at realizing about an additional $500,000 in tax revenue uh, related to the operations of the facility, which will be split between sales tax and the hotel tax. And the construction cost ranges from about $28.5 million to $41 million. Uh, annually, what well, that would mean is we'd have additional debt expense of uh, about $2.8 million to $4.1 million. And that debt would have to be funded through occupancy taxes or property taxes. And we think hotel tax would be able to pay for about $1.5 million of the total debt expense. And the rest would be made up with our city property taxes. Um, and just caveat everything, uh, the actual amount is going to be highly dependent upon site location, construction cost, um, the actual financing terms we might experience. Uh, we're going with kind of a higher end estimate with 5%, um, but given the changing nature of interest rates, that's still kind of highly variable. Um, and given the magnitude of the project, it would require debt issuance um, as well as a additional property tax revenue to fund the project. And we would recommend kind of going the route of a general bond, general obligation bond referendum, uh, which would be approved by the voters to accomplish that. 
and question. any questions? Yep. I had a question. So you were talking about the revenues. You yes. said approximately half a million dollars, which sounds good. But what are the expenses? You didn't. Yeah. So um, that was kind of on the. I'll kind of go back and. I know. I know that yeah. the bottom line, the little. Yeah, we line break even. So the expenses were kind of wrapped up with. Uh, Brian's uh, presentation, uh -huh. we kind of went over that, and from the operations of the facility, we'd be looking at 186, or I think about 186 thousand dollar net profit, um, and that's taking all the op revenues from the operations minus the expenditures from the operations. The 500 thousand is indirect revenues, which are not directly generated by the facility, but it's uh, derived from increased spending in the county, which generates sales taxes, as well as people staying the night in hotels overnight for tournaments and such, which will generate occupancy taxes from hotel stays. So those revenues have no expenditures associated with them, so that would just be money on top of everything else. And I, you're, you're, I know you're the you're the, the numbers guy, so this is, I have a, a, another question, and is, do we have more presentation coming? Because I have another we have, fundamental question. It's just one last slide, yeah. Or maybe a couple. <laughs> yeah. They have a couple more slides about the next okay, steps. Yeah, go ahead, because I, I do have a kind of a core issue question. Um, so if you decide to proceed with the project, I just have a couple um, comments about next steps. So um, typically, this is not something where at the conclusion of the feasibility study, you all hold a vote and say, let's go, let's fund it, we're going to start tomorrow. Uh, there's a, a process that we would recommend that starts with um, forming a task force to, to help lead the project forward. Typically that process can be anywhere from 10 to 12 months to 16, 18 months. Um, but the, the goals of a task force like that are to do a number of things. One is to um, engage the community, do some open houses and public forums and get uh, broader open feedback on the project from, from the community. Um, another big part of it is to start looking at partnerships. So ideally the makeup of the task force would have representatives of different key community partners, um, both public and private, so that you can have discussions about um, how are we going to fund this, what are the interests from public-public partners, what are the interests from, from pri private partners, and what, uh, what those might look like. Um, as I said, you know, engaging interest in partners not just from a funding standpoint, but also are there shared use opportunities? Um, could you share, um, could you locate fields in such a way that you're able to, to combine them with existing fields in the community to kind of lever, leverage what's already there? Um, another big thing, um, possibly in, in my opinion, the, the biggest thing is um, looking at potential locations for the facility. So um, before the project can move past the task force phase, it's really important that, that you look at locations and that you identify um, and hopefully have control over or an option to control um, the site that would eventually be, be built on. Um, also looking at um, potential for, for city and or county tax districts that could help fund it. Can you do incremental financing opportunities? Can you set up opportunity zones um, that could help contribute to the project and capture incremental um, tax revenues on and around the site? Um, looking at the opportunities to potentially do a geo bond, as as, uh, as he mentioned a few minutes ago, um, and then the last piece is is starting to examine. Um, again, um, this is our recommendation. We we would say it, it, it's worth considering the idea of a, of a sponsorship and naming rights partner. Um, so if that's something that that uh, you do want to take a look at, um, we could help you take a look at what those opportunities might be. Um, and, and potentially start, start reaching out to some of those partners. So, like I said, this is a process where we're, we're happy to help work with you through this, but typically it's about 12 to 18 months um, to kind of get you to the point where you can say, okay, this is a go, or um, you know, this might not be a go. Um, this is something I, I could have pulled up before, but when we talk about naming rights, um, this is a, a set of kind of current youth and amateur sports um, naming rights partnerships that we have in our database um, that have been sold over the last, primarily the last decade. So the vast majority of them are in the hundred thousand to two hundred thousand dollar a year range, um, and typically those are for at least five to ten years. So when you're looking at potential partnerships, you can see that 
a lot of these are the same types of companies. A lot of them are regional health systems. So uh, WakeMed, Mercy, um, this is one of Wisconsin's University of Wisconsin Health, Twin Cities, Orthopedics, Health East, Midwest Health, Kaiser Permanente. Um, when it comes to youth and amateur sports and recreation, more than half of the deals we have in our database are with regional medical partners. Um, the next most popular is, is um, banking and financial services. Um, so you're going to see some, um, like a credit union, um, Parkway Bank and Trust, things like uh, like that. And then the rest are typically going to be things that appeal to families. So you, you'll see sporting goods, groceries, um, this is telecommunications, things like that. Law firms. So <laughs> um, we think it's worth considering. And, and one of the things are we get asked a lot by committees that haven't done name race before it, is, well, what if what if the partner that comes to something we don't necessarily want to have on the building. At the end of the day, it's, it's your decision. You don't have to approve anything unless it's a partner that you want to have as a partner. Um, so again, emphasizing in terms of potential next uh, steps and putting together a tax task force, it's not only important what the task force does, but it's also important who's part of it. So making sure that you have, um, obviously, the city of Greenville leadership and staff is, is, is uh, likely going to lead the task force, but making sure you have users, so area sports leagues, soccer, lacrosse, baseball, softball, et cetera, um, county, um, county uh, participation, ECU participation, um, involving some of the tournament organizers that, that are locally based and local partners. Um, your travel and tourism industry um, and, and chamber of commerce type businesses are really important because those are the ones who, who um, are definitely going to benefit from, from having more tourism and, and can help create that, that uh, hospitality environment um, for these types of events. So having, having a good cross-section of stakeholders is really important for a, for a task force like this. So, in summary, let me just make a couple statements. And I think what Ron, Mr. Connolly has tried to say is that this is this is nothing that happens overnight. If it's the will of council to continue to look at this, this is something that's a, a process where you have to go out and you have to engage the further engage the community and further engage partners that would be interested in coming together to help solidify this type of project. So, it, by no means is there any, not asking to write a check of forty million dollars a day. But ultimately, is this something that the council will be willing to continue to pursue through a, um, a, um, a task force? Time for core questions? Yeah. Essential questions? All right. So, um, real interesting, these numbers don't include the, the cost of land, so I think that's a caveat for us all to keep in mind. It's also presuming 5% interest rate. I don't know if that's the, the current interest rate. It's actually much lower than that, which would actually say. The current interest rate is lower than that. Municipal, 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 yeah. municipal, yeah. municipal yeah. borrowing rates are much lower okay. than the. Uh, um, still, land not included, um, and we we have the discussion of the direct benefits, mostly sales tax and occupancy tax. I continue to ask the question when we throw these numbers around of indirect benefits. When we've got eight employees. I just I, I want I, I I just am interested in who is benefiting who 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 are the recipients of, of these indirect benefits and sure. I know we've talked about yeah. restaurants we'd love to see the scullery packed all the time but I mean really is it going to be the scullery or is it going to be McDonald's drive through and Burger King drive through and WalMarts which are not local businesses and we've already taken into account the sales tax from that yeah it's going to reflect it's going to reflect what your business mix is um, so when we talked about about the direct indirect and induced um, the direct benefits are primarily going to be where the visitors are coming and directly spending their money in your community some of that some of that will happen at the facility some will happen at, at restaurants and, and food service places some will happen at hotels. Some will ta happen at retail shops. Um, entertainment is another big one. Entertainment attractions, um, and then transportation. Those are the sectors that visitors coming in are going to are going to spend their money. So that's that's the direct spending um, for for the new people coming in from outside of your community because of this facility for events. Indirect and induced is what happens when a visitor comes, and whether it's Walmart <laughs> or it's a local business, when a visitor comes and they put a dollar into that cash register, 
that dollar doesn't sit doesn't just sit there. It gets then respent by that business, and it primarily gets respent on labor. So it, it, it goes into salaries for people work and, and, and hourly wages as well for people working in those businesses, and then it goes to suppliers. So. Um, if you have more businesses locally that are those suppliers, you're going to have a higher multiplier. And if you have um, all your suppliers are outside the community, you're going to have a lower multiplier. So the in-plan multiplier data that we use, is they, they track all of that data and they adjust it for your community. Right, right. And, and, and again, looking at our community, uh, you know, Walmart takes its money and it goes back to right. Walmart. Or goes to China, which is where their vendors are, and I'm just looking at, you know. So that that's reflected in the multipliers that we purchase from Implant. No, understood. Okay. What I'm saying is that when we talk about who benefits, I, I I'm still not persuaded that it's people in our community that benefit. I would I would venture out. First and foremost, I'd be very careful with saying. I wouldn't be wanting to pick winners and losers in our community, but also keep in mind all those people that work at Walmart <coughs> live here, right? Well, There's employees, they got... and so they're by getting a living wage at Walmart and getting benefits from Walmart, they are benefiting people in our community. So I'd be very careful with that. I understand. Well, first of all, I don't need to be admonished about what I need to be careful about. What I'm saying okay. is that I'm not persuaded we'll get that, later that today. the people of Greenville are going to benefit from this. That's all I'm saying. So we, when you build a facility, wherever you're building, let's say we put all the fields together, historically do you see that things develop around this, that complex to service the industry? They create jobs like hotels and retail establishments. Right. So when the economic impact numbers we show, we only show the new money that's coming from new visitors specifically to attend events at this facility. So we're only factoring in what we call net new economic impacts. So when I talked a few minutes ago about trying to consolidate as much of that economic impact generating activity into one location, that's by consolidating that into one area, that's how you then get potentially a hotel or two that'll build next to it. You get uh, restaurants that'll build next to it. You get retail opportunities that'll build next to it. So that what you, and if you are able to create um, you know, tax increment financing zones or economic development um, areas with tax incentives, you can also, as a community, help drive more of that construction to occur there to capture this new money that's coming in. So ideally, that's what your focus should be as a task force, is to say, how can we, how can we find a location Partner, you know, they can help us partner with existing facilities, expand on those, build new facilities, provide tax incentives for building new hotels there, building new businesses there that are going to help provide a sports tourism destination within our community. Because when we, when you look at sports tourism and you look at the roughly was it ten thousand, ten to fifteen thousand room nights a year you're doing right now. 20, sorry, <laughs> and adding another 50, 55,000 room nights to the community that are not here now, that increment is what you want to make sure you capture in the city and, and, and incentivize businesses to build around it so that you're capturing all of that new money. So it kind of, this type facility could make you just by itself a destination city? Correct. I love the idea of putting something like this north of the river where we're talking about needing um, infrastructure. I think at a minimum, a facility like this would attract a grocery store with a pharmacy, um, restaurants, uh, the types of things that we would love to see over there that would benefit the community that's there. Um, I would love to look at a, a site over there. I think it would be really exciting for that community. I agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that type of approach is what we're seeing more and more of in the sports tourism industry. So right now we're working with the city of Jacksonville, North Carolina, um, as well as um, Cherokee County, South Carolina. And in both cases, they've identified 400 acre sites um, that they want to do economic development projects on, mixed use development, using the sports tourism um, venues the, uh, as the anchors for that development. So. Um, those projects are, are potentially going to be huge with not just the sports and recreation facilities, but also restaurant, retail, um, mixed-use, um, housing, 
um, housing as part of it as well. So from an economic development standpoint, if you can use the, those types of developments not only to attract the visitors, but also um, drive um, you know, new businesses to relocate there, to bring in more residents, and, and to provide amenities that might not be in that area um, right now, as, as you mentioned, that's kind of the ideal that we're working on with a couple communities regionally right now. I'm from Rocky Mount, and so I can talk about my own town. Um, but we, you know, a, a sports complex, were, the people of Rocky Mount were sold a sports complex. And I just, I, these, these things have not happened there. And, um, and that concerns me because when I go back to Rocky Mount, now I do see that our downtown event center has made a huge difference. There are restaurants around that event center. There are. Um, and that is primarily shops. a sports facility. Yeah. It's, it is an event it's an event center. The sports complex is in a different place. So they're, they, they're two different things. I'm not finished. What I was going to say is that I'm concerned that when we're spending 30 to 40 million dollars to build something, and we're taking considerable concentration of our city staff and revenue and focus, that we have you know issues with our downtown, with housing, with transportation, sidewalks. And I think about you know greenways, street paving, and some of these things that come to mind to us. This is a tremendous expense, and I, and I just I'm just still skeptical. Um, yeah, I mean from the Rocky Mount standpoint, we did not work on that project. We we bid on the sports and event center study back in 2014, um, and that is what we call a sports event center. So the primary use for that is sports. Uh, youth and amateur sports. They also have the ability to put an, an arena in there to host like college basketball and things like that. And they have uh, the side of the building that's all meeting rooms. So that's what we call a sports and event center. Um, but that is that was planned and, and is used as a, a youth and amateur sports center significantly. And then the baseball and softball and, and fields that they have actually in a different county, but still within um, within the Rocky Mountain area, those have been there much longer. Um, but yeah, we, we were not involved in that project. We studied it quite a bit, but they put out economic impact numbers annually talking about the impact that that, that the downtown um, sports and event center has had, um, which I think is what you're referring to in terms of the, the, the impacts. So. And they do have music bands. They have jazz. They do, yeah. They have concerts. It, it's, a, it's a multi-use venue. Um, we call it the sports and event center. Yeah. I know the, uh, I've been to the musical event. It's really nice. Went to see Connell's over there. Um, I'm also it's just Thursday in Nashville, and the numbers I looked at, you may be able to. That sports complex brought in ten years, six hundred forty-two million dollars to the community. The problem that Rocky Mount has, because I used to be the place where we used to go for medical care and stuff when I was local. They like us were a tobacco community, and tobacco went away, and they became stagnant because they didn't look forward. And now they're trying to do that. Yeah. And now, like Nashville, I started going to court there in nineteen eighty-six. I just went through Nashville Thursday, and it is crazy what's going on in Nashville. I mean, their development, it's just crazy. Yeah. They're developing that market for Raleigh. And uh, a gentleman by the name Steve Wordworth is really behind all that, and that's what they were talking about. Um, sports complex is just one component. You just, it's just not a either or, it's what we do. But what they don't have that we have is we got a university, we got a hospital that's making this grow. We just got to continue to, to make a, a splash, I guess. And it's not an either or, I don't think. but. Rocky Mount struggled like we struggled, except they didn't have two things that we had. We had a medical community, and we got a the college, and, they had, and I think they're making moves in the right direction. But and it costs comp- it costs some money. Comp- that, that, they're building that sports um, event center downtown complex, it yeah. loses about a million dollars a year. Yeah. And they're, as far as I know, they're they're extremely happy with with the outcomes that they've gotten from that facility. Well, the sports yeah. complex, though, when was it? It was built a long time ago. The, the outdoor complex? complex? Yeah, the it's sports older. complex, not yes. the event. Ten years ago. The sports complex. Yeah, ten, over ten years ago. The outdoor facility. And when they, when, they it, when they built it, when they built it, according to the articles I've read, the city manager was getting all kinds of flack about it. it was not going to make any money. It wasn't going to bring any money into the, into the community. And now ten years later, they can... They can smile because the last numbers I read, it was $642 million in 10 years of dollars spent in the community. It would not have been spent there but for the sports complex. And if you go look at it... Well, they, that about, number, they combined the two facilities. Yeah, yes, sir. But it's about $65 but, million dollars a year in new money. But all that means to be farmland now is really developed. And again, it's not... It, the sports complex is not the own, it's not the answer to their problem. It's a segue into it because they got to attract businesses. But I know some businesses that were 
try to locate there, and they got turned down by the city council. That would have brought a bunch of money to the community and jobs, but for whatever reason, that city council had turned it down. I'm learning. I'm learning about what they're doing. So been educated about what we need to do over here. But again, we've got the college that they don't have, which is a, that's huge for us. What twenty? I know we're down a little bit, but twenty seven or eight thousand students over here, and I don't know how many we employ in, in terms of university community, but a lot. And we've got the hospital. But if I understand, I looked at it. I think I mentioned this in the spring, the earlier spring. This industry is. 60, a $67.1 billion industry is growing at a rate of 20% per year. That's what I read in some, and, and Rocky Mount is getting mentioned. Every time you read an article about sport, they get mentioned. Because I've seen their sports yeah. complex. It, it's, it's nice, but I told them it's the one I want them to ride by to get to the real one in Greenville. <laughs> um, but it's generating crazy revenue for, for that community. It otherwise would not have been there. So, I mean, I get it. It's not a lot in fast food stores and stuff like that, but you know, to uh, bring a spotlight on the community and say, hey, look what they're doing. People want to come to stuff like that. They come here, they might want to locate here. Then we can grow other jobs on the north side of the river, like Matt has said about if we grow the north side of the river, which has really been ignored for a long time, and Councilmember Daniels and I have talked about that, and Councilmember you and I have talked about it, Councilmember Foreman, we got to do something to make the north side of the river grow. Other. So if we put something like that, there's going to be a need for uh, groceries and medical care and pharmacies that we just don't hide, the relatives just barren. Um, and we can court, court, we can court other people over there just besides the sports complex. We're asking the people of Greenville to pay, what was the funding, the debt service, between between two, between three and four million a year to fund it. I mean, I, you know, I, I want to listen to my peers on the council, but we're, we're, we're just asking a lot of our citizens when we, when we say, you know, we, we want we want you to fund this, and we're going to take a lot of emphasis and a lot of energy away from other projects, and to the tune of millions. You know, I just think we're asking an awful lot of the people of Greenville. And and again, I'm not I'm not don't please don't misunderstand. I'm not averse to the idea. I just have read about sports projects and and other projects that impose. A, a, an incredible tax burden on the people, and then they don't generate these numbers, and the people are left holding the bag, and that's a concern for me. You, you know of any sports complex that's not made the record money you're talking about? I'd like to hear about it, because everything I've read is they make record money. Any sports complex that you've been involved in, like you projected 40 some million dollars our first year if it, if it goes in operation, that's if we just do the four fields, right? If I read your numbers correctly, 40 some million dollars. No. Indirect dollars. That was for the uh, the baseball softball tournament complex. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, that's what I'm talking about. Twelve fields. Oh, okay, that was yes, the twelve. The 12 if we complex. jump it up, it'd probably be bigger because the tournaments really go out to the, the greater it, number. It of depends people. how you design it and how you operate it. If Do you, you know any sports complex that you put in this? If you design it to be a sports tournament facility, <laughs> you you partner with tournament organizers to to design it to to meet their needs, and then you have an organization like Andrews that's going out and marketing it. Um, directly to the event organizers, um, it will it will generate an economic impact. It's hard pressed to find any other thing we could do that brings in that kind of money in one year. That's a lot of money to be brought into the community. But where is it going, and how is it changing your community? Rocky Mount is unchanged from this. You drive on North Church Street, you still got that same that one same gas station. And, and, and I'd say bad decisions by that city council is probably most of their fault. Well. You know, we don't have we don't have we don't have empirical evidence for that, and I appreciate that we can we can presume that. But this sports complex was built, and you, you call it farmland. It's actually built out by the airport. Um, it's a very high traffic area. It's easily accessible from US 64. It has everything that you would think would make a smash success and have growth and all kinds of things. It's by the old Hardy's office building. It just hadn't happened. And, and when I go to, to Rocky Mount, I just don't see a change. I don't see a tangible change. Sometimes we talk about, you know, the, 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 the lived experience of people, the daily life of people. I, I'm just not seeing it there. And again, that doesn't mean that Greenville's going to be, you know, uh, have the same result. What do you think Rocky Mount would be if they didn't have that half a billion dollars? So there's something we tell we tell our clients all the time, and it's if you all you're going to do is just drop down a sports complex, walk away, and cross your fingers. It might not be the best idea. What you want to do is 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 create a comprehensive plan for that area. 
And it's about not just putting the, the sports complex there, but it's about incentivizing that other development and having an overall economic development plan for that area that's based a, around creating that sports tourism destination that's going to capture taxes, encourage more growth, um, so that you're not, like I said, the last thing we want you to do is take one facility, plop it down, down somewhere across your fingers. That's that's not the best practices for maximizing the value from these types of facilities. It's certainly, we should really... We really should have the county and PC on board with this because they all we all benefit from a sports complex. So they would have skin in the game likewise to offset these costs to the citizens of Greenwood, spreading it out over the county and the city and the university. And I believe that's you know what Mr. Connolly was saying with the task force. Yeah. If the if what the city did. decides to move forward with a, in, with a task force, is that could those type of partnerships? be created with the ECUs, the county of Pitt, the, the ECU help that would help to, um, to either fund it in a, uh, in a, in a, in kind or in a direct way that would help us to, would help the, the city and, the, and our partners to be able to help cover some of those costs. What, what staff did was, was present to you the information that the council requested. That's, that's, that's the, the numbers you see there. That is not the impact of any types of partnerships that could be derived from that. I'd say we move forward with, it, with creating a task force to get other people's opinions that would, and see if they were, you know, what they think. People in the sporting industry and the private and public sector, we move forward with a task committee to um, yeah. to look at this more in depth and to get not just our our opinions, but yeah, uh, I, everybody. Yeah, I mean, I would I would say I'll, I'll tell you from my personal perspective that you know I I've, I've got a, a daughter that's involved in travel sports right now, and I will be the first one to say that I would not want the city to go out and spend $40 million on their own. I mean, I really wouldn't. I, I, don't, I don't think that would be in our best interest as a city to do. Um, but I think one of the things I've had a conversation with the, the city manager about is I think that you have to have the whole community buy it. I mean, I really do. I think that you need to reach out to some of our ally partners and have discussions with them and see how they can partner, um, see what we can do from a private sector standpoint, see what we could do with the county, see if they would be willing to, to, to join with us, see if the university would be willing to join with us. But I think the only way that you can find that out is by creating a task force. And I think by creating the task force doesn't mean that you're making the commitment to go ahead and fund something like this right now. It's just finding out how we would possibly be able to fund it, or if it's even a possibility. I mean, I think I, I think the, the, the connotation, too, has been that you know, this is only going to help out certain people in our community. That's not the case. I mean, there's, I'll, I'll tell you that a lot of people that are wealthy in this community, they can go in and get a hotel room. They can go travel all over the country. The people that's going to help out are the ones that cannot afford it because they can stay here locally and they go back to their house at night and not have to worry about a, a hotel room or going out to eat four meals a, uh, a day, you know, and feeding their kids and taking their kids around there. I, I talk to many of those parents that are out there, and it's a burden. It's a burden for them, you know, but they want their kids to be involved in sports. There's, some of their kids will excel in sports. Some of them will be really good. Some of them won't, but they'll learn a lot of things that are probably going to help them out and advance them in life. So there's also, there's so many different various reasons that people are involved in sports. It's not that it's just a bunch of elite people going out there playing sports because people from all different demographics are out on those fields, depending on what field it is. Could if we do that, can we go back to the slide where it, with the um, task force potential partners? My concern is that everyone would have equal voice. And so when you talk about the people that are listed as far as the county and the city and business owners, tournament organizers, um, travel and business community, and then you've got the citizens of Greenville and community residents and stakeholders, my concern would be that each person has equal voice. And you're um, concerned about that, or you want to make sure they do? Both. <laughs> Just making sure that, because these are some heavy hitters. I mean, when you think yes, about Greenville, right. this is this is it right here. Right. So I would want to make sure that, so if we're talking about, just for example, um, north of the river and you've got, you know, all these partners coming to the table and then you've got community residents and stakeholders who say, absolutely not, we don't want this in our area, that they're just not steamrolled over and gotcha. because you've got these other partners at the table. So, you know, just making sure that everyone in the room has equal voice and the task force does what it's designed to do. Right. So I think there needs to be some controls in there. Typically so the task force is going to report to, you know, if you form the task force, it's going to report to you all. So you ultimately yeah. have that control. It's usually not a 
decision making body. Well, and I had I had the same point. I was very concerned about if we get people in there who are already invested in it, you know, which which a lot of this has come to us almost like this is something. I I, I still feel that we have really kind of almost snowballed into it. But but okay, I, I think a task force is a good next step. But if the task force is set up with people who are so invested in it already. And we don't have just your normal people that are going to have that tax burden, people that are going to you know, deal, deal with, with whatever it brings for good or bad. I think their voices are, are incredibly mm -hmm. important. I would say, uh, Councilmember Wells, you, you beat me to the punch on that because that's what I was going to say that was missing from Mr. Conley's mm -hmm. presentation there is that we, if, if we're going to go into a certain <laughs> part of the community, mm -hmm. you've got to have the buy-in. I mean, because ultimately it's their community. We don't I mean, like I said, I've said it over and over again, there's certain things that happen in this community. I don't live in that community, and you won't help me make a decision of what goes on in that community. Right. So you have to have the input, direct input of, and the, so the, and the members of, that, of, the, of the community that that will be entrenched in can see the value that will bring them or the value that it will not bring them, and their voice be a part of that. So that is. That may, probably is tied up in the members of the of the community uh, perspective, but that has to be a vital part. Of, and ultimately, I, I think what, who made, somebody made the punk comment: that this is the count, this is the, uh, the city council's uh, uh, task force. I mean, you know, ultimately we can change know, any of those people yeah. up there. We can put anybody up there. Yeah, yeah, and I think part of the, the earlier slide too was um, when you've got potential locations, including community engagement with the. The residents of those locations. Uh, I tell you what, I made. Um, I, I think I made a statement to somebody. I forget who I said it was. It's, I've been in. I've been in fiscal management for 25 years, and I look at myself as a fiscal conservative when it comes to spending money. I'm never, and never in a million years would I come. To, and, and I think my budget speak for that. But I, never in a million years would I come to a council or elected board and say, we're asking you to spend $41 million in, after just six months of betting. Absolutely not. you got to continue to go down the road. you got to get make sure that there's the buy-in, there's the support. And most importantly, the 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 the, uh, the partnerships that are not going to allow this to just be put on the backs of the uh, of of the city taxpayers. The only way you're going to do that is to take the next step, and that's at the will of, of the council. But by no means are you giving a thumbs up to do anything. Everything would have to be done in a smart way, in a methodical way. This is just part of the process. Yeah, absolutely. I know the county is considering a sports complex. The, the uh, you know what uh, the, the county is embarking and don't want to get ahead of myself in this but one of the things one of the parts that you saw there was a tax district in the perfect world you do you create a tax district and all the revenues generated off that tax district the, the future growth in that area goes back to supporting this project if you have new hotels you have new supermarkets you have new retail you have new uh, market rate housing all in a certain area I've heard north of the river. That'd be awesome, but I don't think it's the, the it's not the point to draw the or to pass judgment on any place at this point in time. Until you go through the process, we should not get in front of ourselves with making any uh, ill-conceived perceptions of where this is going. You let the process carry itself, and you don't let one certain area dictate that. It has to be even uh, representation, and each one of you can be part of uh, of helping to determine that, that representation. Absolutely. Thank you for elevating that. Sounds like a place. All right. We good? I think, all right, so I mean, is there, thumbs is there, up to start is there a consensus, I guess, to just move forward with the to, task force? And to bring back and to communicate with each other. We'll talk to each of you about your thoughts on the task force. Is there anybody with, I guess, that does not want to move forward with the task force? I think it's a reasonable next step. Yep. Make a motion or the, nope, no, we're good to go. I'm confused with the workshop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, item number uh, like whatever. Mayor, item number two on the agenda is discussion of housing and community development programs. I'll call forward Director of Neighborhood and Business Services, Tiana Berryman, for presentation. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. I am here to provide um, just an update on some of our housing and community development activities. 
um, Neighborhood and Business Services is responsible for uh, a majority of the activities related to um, those two topics, specifically community development or the division, uh, community development division, uh, whose primary goal is to create and preserve affordable housing. Right. Um, so citizen accessibility to um, these programs really just depends on you know three main um, uh, variables: timeline, how long does it take us to implement these activities, what funding is available, and then also um, the allowable populations, depending on the type of funding and specifics of the project. All right, there are a variety of aims um, that we try to consider and ensure. Um, that um, regardless of where the citizen is currently or um, and also considering where they hope to be, uh, there are programs available. So for home ownership, creating opportunities for renters, uh, temporary support, emergency shelters, um, economic empowerment, and others. Okay, so uh, here we have a list of our most recent ongoing and anticipated activities that are spread across those aims um, to address diversity of need. Um, so you can see we've got Lincoln Park, which everyone has heard um, much about at this point, focusing on um, home ownership and economic empowerment, our rehab program as well, uh, down payment assistance, Arlington Trace, um, TBR rental assistance, our um, um, low-income housing, tax credit um, initiatives, hotel motel lodging, non congregate shelter, coordinated entry, subrecipient programs, uh, construction training programs, Turnberry Trace, which is um, a, an anticipated uh, tax credit project that's already received um, support from the state, and our total partnerships for DERF, just um, partnerships with our uh, nonprofit development community. Okay, and these are all spread across those uh, the variety of, of aims that were just discussed. All right, so we'll just <coughs> briefly skim over some of the activities that we have ongoing. Uh, home ownership, uh, we are looking to create 20 homeowners um, in this block-based <coughs> approach um, over in West Greenville. The city has invested around $2.1 million in both development and buyer subsidies, and we've partnered with um, three uh, nonprofits. Uh, to ensure there are additional um, housing opportunities, homeowner-specific uh, housing opportunities. We've also <coughs> done some, um, some significant rehabs and other things in the area, but this is focusing just on the, the new construction. And if you haven't taken a look, uh, the siding has gone on those homes, so we're moving right along. Habitat for Humanity, um, they, are built, they built homes for low-income families. Um, primarily, uh, their partnership with the city is in West Greenville, also in the Lincoln Park community, um, and just outside. I think they've, they've created about four or five new homeowner opportunities in the past two or three years. Um, and we also partner with Habitat to provide um, down payment assistance for their buyers, and they're partnering with our sub-recipient program. Okay. Our CHODO program is where we work with uh, nonprofit developers. Uh, we are looking to build capacity <coughs> with um, uh, more nonprofits to ensure that we can continue this HUD um, um, mandated program. Uh, it is a requirement of home um, or participating jurisdictions in our home, the home program. Uh, we've most recently worked with Metropolitan um, and are looking forward to uh, working closely with new nonprofits soon. Our down payment assistance program is citywide. Um, it's a significant supplement for Lincoln Park. Uh, the council recently increased the award up to $40,000, and it's compatible with the state resources, which are available to the tune of about $65,000. So we're able to provide about $105,000 subsidy for first time low income buyers. <clears throat> All right. Our home rehab program is also focused on uh, supporting home ownership, more specifically through uh, preservation. Um, so it's a citywide program, and it assists uh, low-income homeowners um, with staying in their home, making those needed modifications so that they're able to um, age in place. We've worked with a lot of seniors, um, but there's not necessarily an age cap or an age requirement with this program. Um, the city expends roughly I'd say on the low end, 800000 but certainly up to about $1 million annually on rehab if you're considering um, both sticks and bricks and then labor. Okay. Uh, considering our mentorship and temporary support, 
uh, Arlington Trace program, uh, project as a partner um, partnership with Taft Mill, the Taft Mills Group, and the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency. There are 180 rental units that are expected to come online at the end of this summer, so we're really excited about that. One, two, and three bedroom units. Um, with a much more reasonable rent rate than you'll find uh, in most um, anywhere else throughout the city. Um, it's supporting 50 to 60 percent of low or, or uh, families that are 50 to 60 percent below the um, average median income, uh, and the rent will be, remain consistent for about 30 years. Not about for 30 years. Um, there are 18 units that are set aside for at-risk community members who are um, at higher risk for homelessness. And the city, uh, well, there's been a $6 million public investment. Um, the city um, invested $1 million from our home allocation and partnered with the state for an additional $5 million in gap financing uh, to um, see this project through. Let's see, um, yes, If I recall, when they first came and presented us this to us, is are the, um, so like the best domestic violence Yes. Victims, are they included at the at risk? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I've got a little shifting going on here, but uh, we're looking at additional rental development for tax credits uh, to increase the supply of our affordable rental housing. Um, this program essentially incentivizes, incentivizes private developers with gap financing like we saw with the Tash Mills Group. Um, we have home ARPA funding that's available uh, to help us dig a little deeper into the, uh, those families who's, um, who have less discretionary spending opportunity, and then we're seeking um, partnership for three uh, projects that are in the pipeline one way or another. Um, Turnberry Trace, which has already received tax credits from the state, um, and we're hoping to um, receive some support from our federal delegation to see that one through. That will produce 72 units for senior housing off of, um, uh, off of Fire Tower, more or less, Fire Tower in Arlington area. Uh, Lynn Beth Place and Park Ridge Trace are uh, two additional um, tax credit projects uh, that are ha that have submitted um, uh, application to the state and are looking to submit their final in May. So that will be coming um, before council for approval uh, on Thursday. So potentially 88 additional units there, um, and that would be a 2.2 million dollar public investment to get those units off the ground. Okay. We also have our tenant-based rental assistance. Um, we have operated this program now for th three rounds. Um, the tenant-based rental assistance program is for 80% and below AMI, um, and it's one-time assistance for um, households who have who rent in arrears. Um, so this most recent round, we had over 500 applications received. About half of those were um, approved, meaning that they met all of our qualifications. That's the only reason someone wouldn't have been approved is if they were not deemed eligible based on HUD requirements. Um, and we awarded a little over $250,000, which is just above what we had budgeted. Um, that $7,628 came from our admin budget. All right, for our emergency shelter, um, we are looking at a partnership for uh, to create additional family um, family rooms or uh, family spaces for um, uh, homeless families. Um, this idea came about um, or really started to, get, to gain momentum during the pandemic. Uh, we did receive an application from Community Crossroads um, that will be coming before council soon, um, and they are the only. Um, they're, pro they're the most prominent in our community who offers um, family spaces uh, for the homeless individuals. So we're looking to increase the number of private family rooms. And our, our, our home ARPA budget for this project is $715,000. That was approved through our um, allocation plan. All right, hotel motel lodging. This will work with community partners to provide emergency housing, um, uh, temporary emer emergency housing uh, through a coordinated uh, regional approach. So the city will sit at the table with other uh, agencies, other service providers um, who are involved in this space um, and provide um, resources similar to our subrecipient program uh, to help meet the needs of uh, families in the area. Okay, this, is also, this will also be CDBG um, CV funded. So we received 
one point, I want to say it was one point one million dollars um, in CDBG CV funding back in 2021. Um, and this funding was largely expended. We had a little bit of rollover, a little bit left over at the very end, and so we're looking to use that to um, uh, find some um, emergency solutions for families. Sean, what does CV stand for? CV? CV. Coronavirus. So we're still going to cover funds? Just a little bit. Yeah. This is the last, the last drop. Okay? All right, so project funding. Um, so, as you see, <laughs> everything up here, for the most part, is funded. We've identified funding. Uh, either we have it now or are anticipating it. Um, Turnberry Trace is the only project that we have not secured funding for. Um, and these are obviously rounded numbers. So we're looking at um, uh, $13.6 million uh, in total for these activities. We're looking at about a two to three year range. It's hard to, to take a snapshot of these projects in one year simply because the nature of the, the programs. Um, so we're looking at about a two to three year range um, for all of these projects. And Sean, if you don't mind, I've got another couple questions. Yes, we're looking at $110,000. That's for the hotel motel lodging. Yes. And then we've got non-congregate shelter. Is that the seven hundred and fifteen thousand dollars? Is that for apartments, apartment rent, or what is it? So non-congregate shelter. We've got. Uh, we did put out an RFP. We received one response from Community Crossroads. It has not been awarded, but uh, we are expecting that contract to come to council in May. Um, the intent of that of the non-congregate shelter project will be to create family rooms or spaces for families. How that agency decides to set it up would really be up to the respondent, but the way Community Crossroads has uh, presented um, this space would be to, it goes along with their um, their ongoing renovation, so that would be created. I think currently they have two rooms, they're looking to expand it. They have four. They have four, so they're looking to expand it to six or seven if I'm not mistaken, um, so that's their intent. And when you talk about a family room, you're saying this is where one family goes. That's correct. Because when I hear non-congregate shelter, I'm thinking, people have space and it sounds like primarily this is just for families at present through community crossroads potentially through community crossroads but an agency similar it does not we there is no there there is no contract with community crossroads currently okay. um, so this space would be instead of having an open dorm style um, that that you know you're probably more familiar with where there are bunk beds or just an open room with with beds for um, I think this it's divided by gender. So they have a women's dorm area and a men's dorm area, and the children would stay with a female um, accompany um, or parent, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they would create <coughs> space for uh, families so that families would not have to be separated in that in that in that fashion. So there would be a room with three beds, something of that nature. And I guess when I look at non congregate shelter, and again, this is just a, mm -hmm. asking questions because I, I don't I don't know how the program works and there's bidding and all kinds of things. I think about you know apartments and, and that kind of thing for everybody. It sounds like this is right now primarily it's just for families and it's just through one organization. We received yep. one response. Mm -hmm. We only received one response, um, and because of the it is a construction project, we did uh, rebid it um, and still only received one response. Okay. Well, you can't do a program if you don't have people want to do it. Mm -hmm. And then you had another question about the hotel motel lodging. If nobody wants to, I guess, build what they're talking about. I, I guess I was thinking it would go maybe for apartment rentals or something like that. So. Oh, I understand. Um, uh, no, so it does not go for apartment rentals. And then the hotel motel lodging was a contract that we had that was also run through Community Crossroads where we were able to provide emergency shelter. Uh, and they, um, so the contract was for 100 and about $140,000. They've expended 110 or close to. And so uh, we've got a, the balance is shifting over to our coordinated entry between 20 and 30,000. And I know this is really Tanya's field of, uh, field of expertise, so, I, so I'm just kind of asking questions. Sure. But, but, but I, I think about, again, when I look at non congregate shelters, is that something we ever want to do or could do where we would put folks up in apartments? You know, is that, is that something that's part of how we, how we use this money? 
it is an allowable expense. Um, however, uh, the city is not administering the, those activities. We are um, providing the funding for a, uh, an entity with the capacity to administer. So we really uh, leave it to the discretion of the applicant, of the, of the, the partner, um, and on how they would best design their program as long as it's within the parameters that are set by HUD. So let me say, um, first of all, uh, I want to acknowledge that based on um, the forms that we had a year ago, mm -hmm. um, as well as the focus groups that we had a year ago, mm -hmm. it is obvious through the efforts that have been taken that we are doing our best to listen to what the needs are to the community mm -hmm. and to provide um, resources that might meet those needs. Mm -hmm. um, so let me first say that and preface what I have to say with that. Um, the, the thing is, is that with everything that is, is being done, um, where we are as a community is we're just not at a place that is, is not enough. And we've had that, that conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I want to say that to the rest of the council. Um, to answer some of your questions, um, uh, number one, we're at a place, unfortunately, um, where the shelter that we have um, cannot accommodate the amount of need that we have. Um, you know, I presented to you all before, so I'm not even gonna hash all of that out, that the face, the face of homelessness in our community is changing um, to where we have a lot more families becoming homeless and we have a lot more senior citizens facing that situation. Um, my last phone call last night was at 9.30. It was with a homeless family. Um, my last phone call um, and situation that I was working on, so two, um, as I was coming in today were with homeless families. And these are with families. Um, so um, also the makeup of, of the situations are different and we've had these conversations um, that um, these are working class folks. So at our forum this past Wednesday, um, I actually was able to get a couple of our families to get the courage to come in and share their experiences. Because it's easy for me to say, I know a man, I know a woman, mm -hmm. but for them to share with you what their experience is, and you all heard a, um, a, 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 a individual with a doctorate who was um, put in a situation where she showed up and she had a notice on her door that the owner wanted the um, um, uh, house back. And so she had 30 days to respond. And because of the situation in our community, it was not even for her that she could not afford it. It was that she could not find anything within a 30 day period. So she and her children ended up sleeping in their vehicle and then living in a hotel. Um, the other young lady that was with us on Wednesday, hospital employee, she's one of our residents in transitional housing right now, um, who works and, um, and lives responsibly. But the situation that we have in our community is that rent is steadily increasing, wages are not. Food is steadily increasing, wages are not. And so we have working class people that cannot afford to live where they work. Um, right now, I do offer transitional housing. So we have five apartments fully furnished down to the washcloths. And in transitional housing at this moment, we're fully occupied and we have waiting lists for people wanting to go in. They're starting to call the city clerk's office if they hadn't figured out how to get in touch with me um, to contact me. Um, and we have a hospital employee, we have a daycare worker, we have a couple that work private sector. Um, I think mom works uh, at a temp agency, dad works at a, at a uh, factory. We have a teacher with her four-year-old daughter that had been sleeping in her vehicle. And just a, a little over three weeks ago, we put an ECU employee in. Um, and so I share all that to say that what we're doing is wonderful. Um, and I don't want to make you all think that I don't appreciate the effort. Um, but with what we have going on in our community now, most of what we're doing is to is, um, project out a two to three year range 
when we have people struggling and suffering right now. And so I want us to continue to look for opportunities to meet the current need. And, um, real quick. and for that to move and move yeah, fast. Yeah. You know, not showing any lack of appreciation yeah. for the efforts that have been taken, um, but to also elevate that right now we have immediate need that is steadily increasing. Um, for families, and uh, I particularly worry about um, families and senior citizens, you know. And, and, and just to articulate what you just said, mm -hmm. I go back to Arlington Trace. If we look at those rent, those rent numbers, I don't know if you can get back there, Tiana. Mm -hmm. I think so. It's so easy for us to just look at a number and just kind of rent and just move on past. Yeah, because that. when you look at it, look at that. Yeah, look at that rent. Six hundred forty-seven dollars. I'm assuming that's for our one-bedroom apartment. That that's is. the subsidized rate. Mm -hmm. If you look at what the hundred percent rate that is not coming through the tax credit project. You're exactly. talking probably twice that much Precisely. for a one-bedroom apartment. Mm -hmm. is insane. A one-bedroom apartment anywhere that you're not afraid to sit on the porch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, let's add that. Um, and, and then, but also when we look at that, you know, we look at 180 units. And I've been out there. I have um, done a tour with Dustin and them. The apartments are phenomenal, okay? On the um, premises, they have a computer room. Um, they even have, in case people can't afford a wash and dryer, they have their own little laundromat in there. Um, they have a space with a meeting room. They have, a, I mean, it's just the amenities are great. Um, but the, the challenge is that with what we have going on in our community at the moment, mm -hmm. it is simply not enough, and it's not, it's just not meeting the need. And so I want us to think collectively, and I want us to think outside the box. You know, the community crossroads shelter. I fully support. Um, work with those folks every day. It is not meeting the need. Um, and, so. and, and what we and I, and I appreciate you making those statements about the direction we're taking. But again, we recognize that we do need to be looking for ways to speed up the process. Mm -hmm. I've often said that we need they need more case managers out there. We've got to have more case managers to be able to react in that need that time when it's when it's yeah, nine o'clock at night, night in that that notice is on the door. They have nowhere to go that we can turn that around quick so nobody has to sleep in their car mm -hmm. overnight or at, at a, a friend's house and they have nowhere absolutely to go. So mm -hmm. it's something we'll continue to have to strive to be able to find ways mm -hmm. to kind of speed that process up Absolutely. to meet the immediate needs of the people. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just don't want to go through this discussion without elevating that and even taking it back to is, is uh, for me very ironic that we're having a conversation of this and now I can truly say sports with an S complex because um, before I was like that's not a sports complex that's a sport complex mm -hmm. um, so um, so um, I, I appreciate that also um, but uh, <laughs> Love you, PJ. But um, hey, you gotta get at least one with softball, one, get one with softball, one with baseball. So <laughs> I understand, I'm saying, but I'm an athlete too. Um, uh, but having the, the two conversations on the same day, um, I thought was very good for me because it helps me articulate where my heart is. Like I, I'm an athlete, so I seriously support the idea of something like that. But it is so hard for me when I am serving people that are homeless and hungry every day to even fathom putting $41 million towards anything when we've got that many people at risk in the community. Um, I, I can't help how God built my little heart, y'all. And so, you know, that is just, that's difficult for me. And so, yes, I do support it. I've listened to um, the baseball families. I've listened to the soccer families, the lacrosse families love them all um, I can see that I'm, I'm an athlete, my children were athletes um, we traveled um, I started uh, USA Track and Field when I was 10, I started doing travel sports So, and it really enriched my life it, it changed how I function it molded how I think now being in anything competitive builds character so I don't have to be sold on any of that what challenges me however is my day-to-day -day work and the day-to-day -day lived experiences that I'm confronted with is me even thinking 
Because I'm like, my God, do you know what we could do with $41 million, you know, um, and how many people we could serve, and, and no one would, you know, be experiencing that. Because the, the ones that I'm serving, you know, um, and I'll say this and, and close, is I'm not talking about people that are functioning irresponsibly and don't pay their rent. I don't believe, if you can't pay, you can't stay. That is, that is, you know, that's how I look at that. Don't take that model. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. but, uh, but, you know, really, I, I, that's not what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I'm um, lobbying at the state level, I'm like, listen, this is not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about that. I am talking about people that are doing what we said in order to accomplish the American dream, what that outline has been, and still are not able to afford to live where they work. And I do realize that the answer is bigger than us offering services, you know, because yes, rent is increasing. I don't think it's going to go in the other direction. Uh, <laughs> so I don't think it's going to go because people are getting the rent now, right? Um, and so, you know, there are a couple of things that uh, are big for me, um, but the other thing is that wages are not increasing. And so as we're looking at what type of jobs come in, as we look at um, who gets those jobs, I thank you all also for working with me with the uh, organization that is going to do workforce development. Um, I appreciate that because I think those type of things make a difference to get people into the workforce that can make a higher wage. But what we're doing is just simply not enough. And so I'm really quiet when we're, we're talking about the sports complex now. Um, because I was already, my mind was already here when we were talking about that. My mind can't leave, my heart can't leave that because that's what I serve every day. Um, and so just want to lay that out there. And um, if we can continue to, te um, to think strategically and intentionally and outside the box to shelter as much as I support them is only one piece of the puzzle. It is not the answer. That is our default setting because that's comfortable. We're not in a comfortable state anymore. So you know, it is the, exactly, and um, and there has to be a space right now for transition. Um, the transitional housing stuff is going so well um, because it's taken more than thirty days. When you know there was a time that we could find somewhere to stay in thirty days, but now what we're seeing is it's taking a minimum of ninety, which is why we do up to four months. You know, because they're just so so um, few affordable options, and without going down a rabbit hole about why I think that is, with you know external investors and all that stuff, we won't go there because I'll have y'all here all night. But I just want to say I appreciate what I hear, um, love, and thank you guys for listening and and doing your best to respond. But we are in a situation where it is still not enough. You remember where you are? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the baby's talking to her too. <laughs> He's like, like that's it, mama. <laughs> um, so our projected uh, outcomes, we're, when we're looking at numbers, these are rough estimates. Again, we're talking about a, about a two to three year range for these uh, activities. We're looking at touching well over 2,500 uh, families, not individuals, but families, um, through all of our programs combined. Um, and subject to increase, if certainly if we can get support um, for additional funding. Is the hotel program going to continue? Uh, the, um, so no, the, that was a um, hotel motel was funded through CDBGCV, and that funding has to be expended within five years. So it will, none of the CV funded programs will be able to extend past 2026. Mm -hmm. And it goes, and the and the money goes. It's like much faster water down than that. faucet because um, yeah. it costs four hundred and fifty dollar, four hundred and fifty to six hundred dollars per week yeah, to stay in a hotel. So it's just not long term sustainable. Um, and Perfect. even with our um, efforts with the rental assistance, which we greatly appreciate, mm -hmm. 
you know, um, that was $257 spent in 45 days. And that only served half the families that um, had applied for. But again, I'm not saying that to um, um, condemn the efforts. I'm saying that as a reflection of how much need exists. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't want us to are. exactly. I want us to really stand on the, on the foundation of truth of where we are. And so that is not an area of condemnation in any manner. It's just to reflect. If we were able to do that in 45 days, um, and I, I think hotel money, you know, um, because y'all filtered it through the shelter, and you know, sometimes they can't be so friendly. Can't you know, that is it goes so fast. And Lynn and I, with the county, <coughs> work together a lot, and you know. Um, we talk all the time about how fast those funds go when it's rental assistance or hotel assistance because, you know, the need is so great mm -hmm. and what hotels are so expensive. But our, our, our ability to support families is capped at 30, uh, excuse me, three months. Mm -hmm. So one family can be served up to three months. Um, with most of these homeless, um, homelessness um, uh, support, or, you know, those type of programs are a hotel, motel, real assistance. We cannot exceed three months of support for any one family. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, with with that in mind, uh, here's kind of a, a sneak peek. We've got our annual action plan coming up. That is part of our ongoing engagement uh, process. Um, we have a citizen participation process uh, for each um, each major um, uh, point in. Um, our HUD funding process. So the 2024 to 2025 action plan, we are anticipating about a little under uh, $1.5 million coming in um, for this uh, upcoming year. And obviously our the amount of activity that we've gone, have, we have going on far exceeds that 1.5. So we have program income that is reinvested uh, year after year. Uh, we have additional resources that we're able to leverage because of this funding. So by no means does this, does this suggest that we don't have what we need to accomplish what was um, just presented. Certainly we would be open for more, um, but I don't want these numbers to be alarming. So we're looking at um, a cap of 20% of, of for CDBG and 10% for home in terms of admin. Uh, most of our funding uh, goes directly into um, services. Our rehab for this upcoming year, we're looking at a little over half a million dollars. Acquisition and demo, um, 35000 if we're able to um, secure any additional lots to uh, either directly develop or support development of, um, of um, single family units. Down payment assistance, um, 160000 Our CHODO program is a required 15% of our home allocation. Um, we just simply are looking to develop um, partnerships with nonprofits to um, bring more units on the ground. Rental development, uh, about a quarter of a million dollars that could go into one of these tax credit projects. Our public service uh, is uh, 130,000, which is about 15% of our CDBG allocation, and that brings us to just under um, that 1.5. Like I said, it does not include program income, which is reinvested year after year. Um, and once we have, are able to sell the six. Um, homes that are being um, built over in Lincoln Park that will bring us an additional easily 1.2 million dollars to add to this budget. Okay. All right. Are there any additional questions? Oh, yes, ma'am. I do. I have one, and that, I don't want to open up a conversation that's not germane. But I'm thinking about the gentleman with the house on Ward Street. Are any of these rehabilitation dollars available to him for his project? Unfortunately, no. That's something that we evaluated early in that process. Yeah. Um, those, it's for owner-occupied units. Um, we did take a look at his situation yeah. to see if we could assist with any of our existing programs, but he would not be eligible. Since he's not living there, is that right? Yeah. That is the primary reason for the owner-occupied um, rehab issue. That's too bad because he can't he can't live there because it's not it's not livable. So. That was um, kind of gets in the fine. Thank you. You answered my question. Well, can't, you can't argue with HUD. I understand that. That HUD has its rules. When are we going to see the contract for community crossroads? Uh, in May. The expectation is May. Cool. I'm good. All right. 
Moving on to the third item here, presentation of Great Transit System Updates. I'll call for Director of Public Works, Kevin Mulligan, for a quick, quick presentation. <laughs> Running up across the park, so uh, let me actually uh, turn the time around and make sure I'm staying on target here. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council. Today we will review several updates to our transit system. Uh, those items are um, talking about extended hours for our transit service as well as the budgetary impact associated with that, some technology upgrades necessary for those extended hours as well as some infrastructure improvements. All right, uh, a little bit of background. Uh, this is our current um, current route. Uh, we have a one-hour headway. Fancy way of saying it takes an hour to get from uh, back to a stop. All right, so route one is the blue route. That's right here. It goes to the mall and Alice Keene. Route 2 is the medical. 3 and 6 is the southwest and, and Pitt Community College. Uh, 4, the grid and north of the river. And 5 is uh, east and as well as the mall and, and goes out to Walmart. All right. Um, extending bus hours. Let me just show you that here is our current. So seven, uh, approximately 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we're proposing to change that to uh, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., so pretty um, significant change. Um, we also currently do not operate on Saturday, so we're looking to um, operate from 9 to 4, 7 hours on Saturday. That will uh, require us to go from 8 full-time drivers to 13 full-time drivers, uh, 2 to 3 part-time, 6 full-time on Saturday. All right, <laughs> steps to extend the bus service hours. Uh, promote and hire additional drivers. We're, you see we're going from 8 to 13. Uh, install fare boxes, train all transit personnel, bring in a contracted employee. We um, have a con current contract to have uh, personnel at the front ticket booth. We currently um, we have one of our drivers doing it to uh, fulfill the number of hours in a week. Um, the last item there, set the launch date and advertise system changes. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. All right, extending bus service hours, uh, the impact to our budget, um, increasing weekly service from 50 hours to 77 hours per route. That is a 54% uh, increase in service hours, uh, increasing the cumulative uh, full-time hours of our personnel from 360 to 520. Uh, the main expenses um, would be what you would expect, salaries, fuel, parts, maintenance, and down at the bottom there, um, our operating cost roughly per bus is about $120 per hour. So if we're increasing by 54%, uh, we're going from 1.8 million, 1.9 million uh, annually for six buses to about 2.9 million. So significant uh, increase. All right, um, this is our transit budget. This is our fiscal year 25 proposed budget. FTA contributes uh, funds through the FTA grant, uh, 5307. FTA grant, which we bring to council every year, and um, this year it's about 2.46 million uh, coming up, which would require a city match of about 965,000. That uh, city match would be higher, but the state offsets it with uh, $475,000 of state maintenance um, funding. So um, again, FTA is 80% for capital and 50% for operating. All right, so. Our total budget this year is going to be for fiscal year 25 is approximately 3.9 million. Kevin, how does the, how does the, how do those local funds compare with what we have for our current level of service? Yeah, so this local fund is increasing just about to get to that was increasing by about 300,000. Uh, so plan to return to a sort of offset that 300,000. How are we going to? Um, we've looked at a couple options and. Um, the, um, this is what many other um, transit agencies have done and what we're proposing to do. Many transit agencies, like ourselves, suspended fares during uh, the onset of COVID. Some returned, uh, you see that uh, Willington down there uh, returned about three months later. Uh, Raleigh's returning to a, a fare based system later this year, and we're proposing to uh, later this year as well. Um, you look at the uh, the fares, dollar uh, twenty five for Raleigh, uh, Fayetteville, then Greensboro, Jacksonville, Wilmington go up. Part is the Piedmont area transit, and that connects um, that connects Greensboro and and um, a few other uh, Winston Salem, uh, High Town. So um, High Point. High Point. 
So that, that's a bit more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it works, yeah. It works. Okay. Mm. It's all good. He's saying hot tail. No. Hot tail. Hot town. Hot town. Keep going, Kev. <laughs> so we propose a fare of a um, dollar twenty-five with a discounted discount rate of seventy-five cents. That would be for students. Uh, for senior ridership for veterans and those with disabilities. Um, our single paratransit ride would uh, go up to 250. FTA sets that as twice whatever your rate is. So currently it's, it's zero because we don't have a fare. So it's twice for what the single ride is. So we we'll propose 250 on that. And by para ride, you mean if you have to change routes or? I'm sorry, paratransit is um, the county actually operates that for us. Oh, the so If you have a um, approved disability and need to ride a um, with the county instead of riding with our bus, um, you call the county and schedule that ride. Okay. And you schedule it a day in advance. <coughs> So our plan to return to a uh, fare-based system, uh, you see where we are, um, we're right there with Raleigh, Fayetteville, uh, right below Greensboro, Jacksonville, Wilmington. So $1.25, um, you know, right there, sort of middle of the pack, or the, the, the low end of the pack there. So we would, uh, and I'll talk about the schedule in a, uh, in a few seconds. Um, we will look to promote and hire additional full-time drivers. We're doing that now. Um, that would be ongoing through the through the first quarter of 25. Uh, we would our first place we usually look for our full-time drivers is with our existing part-time drivers. Uh, so we'll need to hire and train additional part-time drivers, um, install fare boxes, and train all transit personnel on the use of those. Um, again, bring in the in, in trained contracted staff to run the booth. Uh, on the fare boxes, we advertised an RFP, a proposal we received last week. So we'll look to have that uh, before council um, probably in June. How do we train the drivers? One more time. How do we train the drivers? So 80 hours of, uh, of onboard training and, and classroom work. So a lot of them come with experience. We train them on our routes. Uh, we train them on our safety procedures. Um, so the, they are... Um, Riding in a bus with our driver for 80 hours, whether they're a passenger or whether they're driving a bus with, with someone else there. Does that require a specific class license? CDL. Uh, CDL with a passenger endorsement. And of those 80 hours, is that split up like eight hours a day? Or? Oh, yeah. Okay. What, what are we doing to make the public aware that this is going to take place in October? So uh, working on that, uh, that's the last piece, the public outreach and advertise the system changes. I think the first step is bring it before council and get council approval, and then we'll uh, start reaching out to the public. On it. We will do an extensive amount of okay. advertising. Like put it on the buses some way so that you know, <coughs> the buses can know this is coming and get plenty of advance notice that this is coming in October. That's the first place we would start is on the buses, <laughs> letting our, our current ridership know, but also trying to attract new ridership, additional ridership. We will go above and beyond. We're, we're partnering with Brian Ritchie. I think with these routes, I think with these routes and extended hours, there there should be increased ridership. Kevin, I don't want to jump ahead. You may already be addressing this, but at some point we were talking about doing kind of an Uber or Lyft on demand car system. Where yeah, is that so part of this? Or we've been talking with work? our uh, proposed partner on that, and um, uh, we've offered several options, several fiscal options, financial options, and uh, waiting to hear back with them and probably a few more weeks before we have to decide whether or not we go in a different direction. It's a, it's a still a working process. It's, okay. not, it's, it's a working process. It's a pilot yeah. program. Yeah. We're proposing. We're wearing them down. Yeah, we are. <laughs> we are putting the pressure on the We got Ken on that one. Yeah. Yeah. We're putting we'll the pressure on that. How's our uh, current staffing levels? For bus drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, so we currently have uh, eight full-time drivers. We would need to hire five more. So we're fully staffed right now. Um, Sorry. No, we're not fully staffed. <laughs> so we're. They uh, work something out with the community college. Mm -hmm. They have a truck driving. They, they do. They do. Yeah. You know, not to get into. I will say we have a monthly call with DOT and uh, uh, all the transit agencies in the in the state and. 
hiring full-time transit drivers has been a challenge uh, since the pandemic started. Things are starting to relax and we're getting more applicants, but okay. um, we're confident that we can hire those five in the, in the allotted time period. Okay. So this cost us. Yeah. Well, it's great yeah, to I see agree. that um, the hours have been extended um, pretty much to match, um, like, uh, hospital yeah. employee hours yeah. and things yeah. of that sort. Yes. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Certainly yeah. is one of the considerations. Um, so that's been on the extension of the bus service hours. Um, some technology upgrades. Um, we upgraded the security camera system. Uh, our Previous cameras were, um, were starting to fail on us, so we replaced all of those on all 13 buses. Um, again, the RFP for new technology, it says currently open. We did receive, um, I think, eight proposals last week um, on automatic vehicle location, pass automatic passenger counts, uh, voice enunciation in two languages, as well as electronic fare collection system. And we'll come back to council with more on the electronic fare collection system. When we present that, uh, um, when we present the um, the RFP, um, and then when we come back with what system we we selected. All right. Also, did want to talk about uh, bus stop improvements. Um, there's some ARPA mm -hmm. funding, as well as some 5307 grant funding. Uh, we're looking to replace our shelters, provide additional shelters, as well as um, benches. Our goal is to um, have a bench or shelter, a bench at, at every um, at every bus stop. So some complications with that, we'll work, need to work with DOT on encroachments, but that process is underway. Now that's some good news. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we are, we are <laughs> focused to move that line as you, long as we yes. possibly can. Thank you. Get one north of the river. Please. I've been hearing about it for, for years. <laughs> that's a, this is a big deal right here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's deal. some, but... Yeah. Does that include like on green any accessibility like that train tracks? projects for this? For that's dangerous. People mm. with disabilities? Yeah. So that's a, um, our buses are fully ADA accessible. And they have, um, you know, ADA access to the stops. So um, the connecting sidewalks to every stop is something that's not in this funding. Uh, again, all of those sidewalks are, most of those sidewalks are on DOT uh, right of way. So we're working with them. We do have uh, several st uh, state transportation improvement projects that will uh, address that. Um, so in the next five years, I, I would expect our sidewalk situation to be much more likely. Maybe uh, stay tuned to the budget. <laughs> right now. Yeah. We'll say anything else. Potential Okay, is that is. Yeah. Okay. That's it. All right. That is. Mayor, that's uh, all we got. That's it. I got a motion to adjourn. <laughs> what? All right. I got a motion by Council Member Scully, second by Council Member Robinson. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Who say nay? Motion by Council Member Scully.